so um, I'm gonna be talking about mastering today. For those of you that you see it on the Facebook page, you want lights on? Um, yes. Sure. Yeah, lights. Um, no. I'm hoping I can keep it relatively coherent. I was, I was, I got like no sleep last night because my laptop literally bricked itself at like a crash during an update and bricked itself at like 10 p.m. So I got no sleep. But um, I'm gonna be talking about mastering. What I'm gonna do is just run y'all really quick through this mix down um, of a Heaven Trap track I did uh, a couple months back. Um, I picked this one to go through my mastering chain for y'all because it's it's got a lot of you know stereo spread elements and it's 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 a very aggressive track. If you're trying, there's a million ways to skin a cat, and this and and so when you're mastering. Everything I tell you today is kind of just like a suggestion. You know, do what sounds good. But this is, these are just general, you know, ideas and tips and tricks on how to on how to master. Uh, but when you're doing when you're mastering a track for loudness, you know, for just an aggressive sound, it's pretty straightforward what you want to do. So here's the mix down. Yeah, I'm not getting crap. <laughs> uh, on your devices, yeah, don't no, no, worry no, about no. it. Yeah. Um, you actually can't do it. Um, yeah. So this is a pre match by the way. Got like loud enough when you're good, I'm behind the monitors. down um, and you don't want to have to fix anything from your mix down and master. So your mix down should be passable as a final project product. You want to get your mix down as close as you possibly can to the point where you're just sitting there thinking, all right, there's nothing more I can do to this mix down. Um, and then it can be still be peaking at negative 12. Just render it. What's up? So in theory, even if it's being at like negative 30, you're, you're cool. Yeah, well, since this is digital, the noise floor is so low that unless you're peaking at like negative 50, negative 60, Doesn't matter. you can still keep on bumping it up and you're never going to get any sort of audible. Um, so by the way, I have this entire talk, I just wrote it out, I had nothing nice. um, Yeah, uh, so I'm going to upload it. Sweet. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's kind of... Um, all right, so yeah, so what are we trying to accomplish with mastering? <laughs> Besides, 
Um, in some cases, making your track louder. Um, you know, in, in a lot of cases, you don't want to do that. This is just if you're making some big room house track or some big big room trap track, I guess. Uh, there, there's, you know, people, you might want to make it louder and then, um, and then you kind of want to make it balanced to where it'll sound the best on as many systems as possible. So your mix down should sound perfect. You should get it sounding perfect to you and it should bang on your nice monitors, but your master should bang on a pair of crappy blown up car speakers. Uh, so I would go ahead and balance this track to audio. I already went ahead and... Is it that cut and dry or do you, you still need to be considering other speaker systems when you're mixing, right? Yeah, I, I like to reference on... Um, I'll play through my monitors and then headphones and then I'll do my laptop speakers, phone speakers, uh, take it out to my car. Before mastering? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, which is why I was really upset when I accidentally blew one of my laptop speakers. I can't reference on it anymore. Um, what crappy audio cards like in your phone and your, and your, um, and your laptop will did not detect clipping. Uh, or they, the clipping, you'll hear clipping where you, where you wouldn't hear it in nicer cards. You want to all have a question? Uh, yeah. I was just going to talk about whether or not you should, do you use reference mixes when you're mixing? Um, I, sometimes. Um, it depends on what I'm, I mean a lot of times yes, but it depends on what I'm going for. If I have a specific track in mind that I'm trying to reference, then yes, but uh, if not, then no. Can you explain how you do that? Reference tracks? Yeah. What is a reference mix? Um, a reference mix would be if you have a track that you, it's like if you had a track that you wanted your track to have the same like overall tone as, um, you just okay. kind of AB it. Okay. During mixing and mastering. So um, here we are on the mastering, uh, and I know I told you that you know you want to you should not be fixing anything in mastering. You shouldn't be thinking about mastering when you're mixing. You should not leave and can, pretend you're not you're never going to get to master it. So that's the final product. And then once you're done with your mix down, take a break for a day or two, get clean, get fresh ears, and then come back at it with a complete paradigm shift. Come back at it looking like, like thinking about it like. Oh, some random person came up and gave me a mix down and wanted me to master, and it's really crappy, and it's my job to fix it. You got to look at it objectively because mastering is all about making compromises in dynamic range. Say dynamic range. If you want to get a louder track, you're going to compromise in dynamic range. If you want to get, if you want to have better frequency response on systems on smaller systems that don't have much bass response, well, then you're going to lose a lot of the depth to your track by by you know adding uh, harmonics to the bass and such. And I'll, I'll go over that, but. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's all about compromising. Um, so the main two ways to approach mastering um, is a just your conventional left right st uh, stereo channel and and you and people like to split it up into lows, mids, and highs, and then focus on the lows and focus on the mids and focus on the highs. So you have a lot of control of dynamics and it's it you know it's good for uh, Live, like live bands, rock music, stuff like that. Then the other uh, way to do it is mid side, and mid side <coughs> splits it into mid channel and side channel. Now we, I know uh, you were talking about that at some point. Do you, are you all familiar with mid side? No. Okay, so um, I dropped two. I just dropped the track, my my mix down in in two spots, so they're playing on top of each other, um, and. I grouped them together. So mid bus, side bus, and a master bus. On my mid bus, I just dropped a utility tool on. There's a million ways you can do it depending on what doll you're in. This is the easiest way. Drop the utility tool on it and put the width to zero. So it cuts so. it cuts out all you know, you have you have a left and a right channel, but if you're playing a mono signal and these and so these are both playing the exact same sound, it's gonna sound like it's coming from right here. Those signals are called phase coherent, because they're exactly they're exactly the same. But if you have two completely different signals, those are phase incoherent, and those are going to sound like they're coming from the sides. From the, so anything that's phase coherent is going to sound like it's coming from a, a invisible third channel right in front of you. And then anything that's phase incoherent, that is, it's just different, is going to, is going to be the side channel. So when you, when you drop, when you uh, move the mid bus to mono, you get, let me go to just like the area where... It's really true, you just have to do it a long time, it's different.
different uh, different mode of view. But so on the side bus, you just basically chopped out everything that's mono. On the side bus, everything that is phase coherent is out. So any any signal that matches up between any it, it just sums the two, and any okay. signal that that matches it takes out, and that's your side bus. So how'd you do that? This, I use the utility tool, um, it's on an Ableton, and you can just go down here to the width and drop it. There's a million different ways to do it. You, depending on what DAW you're in, you can Google how to collapse to mono. Um, cool. And most tools that'll, that'll allow you to collapse to mono will also have an option to collapse to the side channel. A lot of EQs, EQ8 on Ableton, you can just pick like side or something like that. And, you know, you can mm -hmm. mid or side, you can solo those. Yeah, um, FL Studio has a knob in the mixer. If you go to the like expanded oh, mixer, it does. That's just been <laughs> don't, 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 don't use that. Uh, <laughs> so that's actually like, uh, use the stereo shaper. It's actually just a plugin that comes in with FL Studio. It's much more cohesive and actually works. The stereo enhancer knob in FL Studio will give you facing problems. Yeah, you don't, stereo enhancer, I, I do cover stereo enhancers or stereo imagers in this, but. Um, don't use them unless you're trying to collapse your stereo image. You don't want to use them to spread. They lead to phasing, to just nasty phasing. Um, I'm going to focus on the mid bus first. Um, since this is an aggressive track, we want to make it louder. We're going to be reducing the dynamic range. Um, I think we're going to be increasing the volume at the cost of reducing the dynamic range. Um, but uh, so you might think, well, why don't we just you know compress the just compress it and then limit it. Well, because there's a bunch of frequencies in there that, you know, I got my mix down as clean as I could, but there's still some unwanted frequencies. They may be peaking at negative 70 dB or something like that, so you can't, they're inaudible, but, but they still add to the overall dB level of your track. Because your limiters, your compressors, they're not, they're not hearing it like you are. They're, they're just literally just summing it, and they're, and they're getting the overall output. So, you want to get rid of those frequencies. Well, how do you get rid of them, Colin, if... You can't hear them. Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, here we have, there's a technique using EQs um, called uh, boosting and cutting. And so we're going to want to remove these nasty frequencies before we ever do any sort of dynamics processing. That's compression, limiting, etc. Um, so here's my mid track. I'm just going to loop. Um, I'm just going to go to the busiest section of my mix and I'm going to loop it. And then if you get that clean, then all you have to do is make sure that you didn't take out too much information. Go back and listen to, you know, go back and listen to the quieter parts, make sure it's not too bad. That's just, that's not a rule, that's just some of what I do. Um, so I'm going to be using uh, FabFilter Pro-Q, which I know not a lot of you have, but it's just the fastest um, for EQ real quick. Is it free? No. no. Okay. Um, I'm, but every plugin I use, I'm, keeping very basic functions. It, you can find every function I use in every single plugin, you can find basically on a, a so stock. You can uh, use EQ8 for what he's about to do. You can use EQ8, you can use. Just engage over sample. Yeah. Um, so, <coughs> turn on my, this one, this is also nice because it has a, an analyzer. But, um, so where are these mysterious frequencies that I can't hear? Well, I'm gonna create a new node. I'm gonna boost the Q up really high, that's the slope, so. When I go up and down, that's what that's what Q is. It's the slope of it. So I'm gonna boost one very specific range of frequencies, and I'm gonna just pump it like 15 decibels, something stupid. And I'll give a little more so I can go through literally and pick frequencies that are out of tune. You know, frequencies that are, um, say I'm in a major key, I can pick minor frequencies that don't really belong. What's up? Can you dumb the last minute down a little and re say it? Yeah, um, where, from the, yeah, sorry. From when, from, you probably, made, from when you adjusted the Q, you went in and then So I adjusted the Q, made it really high, and then I boosted the shit out of the game. Why'd you do that? Um, so that whatever uh, frequency I'm at with this, little stupid peak thing yeah. is extremely accentuated. I can hear that frequency. So if I'm <laughs> if I sweep the spectrum right. and I pat I'll be able to hear all the fundamental frequencies, all the harmonics, and if you know what key you're in, you know it sounds it sounds relatively pleasing. Yeah that warbling yeah. sound you're hearing? Yeah and it goes it gives me oh, 
So <coughs> you can sweep the spectrum, find frequencies you don't want, and then when you find that frequency, say it's... So say it sounds out of phase. You want to do out of tune and out of phase frequencies, one sec. And so I'd say I found that frequency that I don't want. It's not too offensive, so I don't want to take it down by like six decibels, but I'll notch it down by like two and a half or something like that. So that's now notched out. And now I can do it again and just comb and comb and comb and find all the frequencies until I can't find any more. And, th and that's when you know you've done your best job of getting all those frequencies out. What's up? Yeah, I get out of two frequencies. Explain out of phase frequencies. Yeah, so on your mid bus, um, you're getting the mono signal, um, but some frequencies and the... Some of the frequencies that you uh, hear, if it's out of phase on the mid bus, it's going to be going. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's going to be warbling. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, it's pretty much as simple as that. And and if it's out of phase, but it's a really important frequency, like a fundamental or a fifth or a third or something like that, you don't want to get rid of it. You don't have to. But some of them you want to get rid of. Um, so I use five just because of how many it lets me use. This is my. I did. I had some nasty sub harmonic on there or something. Um, but I did all this, and then I went through and I really cleared out the um, mid range. I can actually give you all. So this is about the first one. Notice you don't really hear any difference. It sounds exactly the same, almost exactly the same, and just as loud. But if you check the, de the decibel peak, it's going to be peaking at half a decibel to a decibel to two decibels lower because I've taken out all that offending material. And which we never could hear in the first place, but those compressors could hear. So that's important. And then you'll really probably be able to hear uh, the second one where I get rid of the mode. Really makes it flat, kind of like. Again, it's it's you know it's all a matter of just doing it a bunch, do it over and over and over again. I mean. The, the guy that taught me all how to do all this, I texted him yesterday and I was like, hey, I'm going to talk tomorrow, any tips, tricks, advice, pointers, and he said, master everything. Even if it's a bad master, you don't have to put it out there, but it, you'll get good at mastering. So like this, you know, my first masters looked like crap. So this is after doing it, you know, 30, 40 times, you can kind of, you know, figure out what you're trying to do. What's up? In a nutshell, what you were doing is you made like a really high Q, really amped up, mm -hmm. not node. Mm -hmm. And then you just sweep the spectrum until you found that like weird wishing sound. Uh, until you find a frequency you don't like. Anything that's out of tune, anything that's painful. I sometimes I'll just go through and if it just grates on my ears, there's a lot of that in the three kilohertz range, there's a lot of that up in like twelve kilohertz, thirteen kilohertz. Okay. So And it's just it, it'll hurt your ears. Just take it out. I mean you don't hear that crap. So you just sweep the spectrum until you find a point and then when you hit that point you just notch you it down. Notch it out. And you can be really aggressive over in the bass frequencies because bass frequencies have, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll mention this later, but they'll have a lot more, at the same power level, they'll have a hell of more higher dB output. Um, and so you can notch those down like 6, 8 dB if you know it's some bass frequency you don't like, some bass harmonic. I um, warn you about doing that too low because and if you're going to want to do that too low, try to look up a linear phase equalizer because uh, notching frequency is super hard in the lower frequency uh, where the sub frequency exists is going to move your phase for a lot of that stuff because equalizers generally the way they work is they filter phase so that's going to move your bass frequencies out of phase with the rest of the track and you'll end up with the original problem which was that you were out of phase to begin with so well I done fucked up <laughs> um, that's the uh, so that's my mid track um, and then I have you know, like how I've said all these rules, you know, you can break them if you want. I've, I've got some poor practices on this mix. Namely, I think this one, I've got a, I've got a, just a, a game stage on each of these. And there's a point over here after I've done mastering where in the second verse it kept clipping and no, no amount of mastering was getting, stopping it from clipping. So I just ducked the volume. I said, screw it. Um, so moving to the side bus in terms of processing, we're doing the exact same stuff. Um, you're not going to be listening for out of phase frequencies, obviously. Um, so you're again just listening for offending frequencies, and then if you notice, I high passed at like 110. Well, that's because that is the um, for this track the only bass that's coming through is my kick and my and my sub. 
Well, those you don't want those in stereo. I mean, you'll if you know if you're playing through a system that has one sub and is summing it to mono, well, you're going to get phasing issues. So I completely remove all the side information. So my sub is mono. You want to keep your kicks and your subs mono as a general rule. I mean, yeah. again, rule may be broken. Um, I, uh, they basically, do what you like. You can, don't you know? Don't feel the urge to like you know strictly follow all these rules. If you decide you want to do something different, fucking do something different. Um, so side bus. Where am I? Doesn't sound much different. A little less creepy. But I do have high back filter. Uh, keep in mind that your side channel, that all the meat of your track is in the mid. That's where all the power, all the, all the oomph comes from. The side channels the just kind of glitter on top. Like it's just stuff, you know. So you can you can make some you you can. You want to focus most on the mid channel and the side channels for adding a little pizzazz at the end. Um, so, I, so, so, in a way, the mid is like the body of an airplane, and the side is like the wings. No. Well, no, because the wings are kind of necessary. A side track, a good, a good, a really good mix. You could sum it to mono. To say you're playing in a club that didn't yeah. have, and again, we're talking big EDM stuff. But like, you know, you're gonna play in a club that subs to mono. Most of them don't do anymore, but some still do. It should still sound relatively. So you shouldn't really need the side channel. Um, you want to make sure that if you print it to a vinyl, it will still sound good. Because that's what mine yeah. is mono. Yeah. Right. All right, so we've gone through the EQing. I've got a bunch more details in this transcript that I'm going to upload to Facebook. And y'all can read through if you want. There's no way in hell I'm covering all this. Um, Show waveform pics. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's because we're still doing we just show away from picks. <laughs> That's, you're talking about um, getting headroom out of removing frequencies. Yeah. Um, so, what, like I was saying earlier, when those when those nasty frequencies are no longer there, um, they're no longer affecting the. You know, it doesn't really sound any different to you. But it's now you can compress that signal without having to worry about getting that overly squashed. I think in there I said that the I'm 12 and I just learned how to compress sound, which is just like, there's no power. It's just like, it's just, you know. So, um, I have, here's someone that used, they, they didn't put a limiter on it, but they over compressed it. Well, your peaks are like, they're not really above your signal. That's just, that's just going to sound muddy, just, you know, like, you, you know, you, you want some dynamics in your waveform. That's just an example that I had. And this person just slapped it on a limiter. <laughs> Obviously, you're getting no dynamic range. <laughs> <That'd be laughs> <a> remix. <laughs> I know. Um, and this one's obviously a joke. Like they probably just threw it and saw it, like in a million did, like Maximus or whatever. People seriously do that. Like they just drop a sound good around and shit. Oh god, it kills me. Um, How do you do that? Really yeah, don't do that. <laughs> um, so yeah, done with EQing. Um, let me close out the Chrome. I keep tapping over to it. Um, so done with EQing, and now we're going to move to, everything we do from here on out is going to be to the master, this isn't the master bus, that's the master bus, but I call it, the, I don't know, it just doesn't really matter. But we're doing this to the group, to both the tracks at once. You could do dynamics processing to separate tracks, um, like the mid and the side, but you know, it doesn't, that'd be too much work, and I'm lazy. Um, Basically, now that we've gotten all those nasty frequencies out, now we can start to do some dynamics range, some compression, some you know, some dynamics processing, and we don't have to worry about bringing those nasty harmonics out. Because again, like another thing is, if you compress the shit out of the signal, you're gonna and you're taking those peaks down. Well, then the quieter parts, all those sounds that you don't really want to hear, are gonna come up. Wait, sorry, can you clarify something? Uh, you so when you're doing side the the side the monos mid side mid side yeah. compression. You said you're sending the same track like to both, and then just making one all mono and mm -hmm. one all stereo. Yeah, that is. Do you want me to clarify how I did that? No, no. I just wanted to make sure. That oh, so yeah. You're and not like choosing. Okay, I want this to be mono. I'll send it there. I want this mm -hmm. to be stereo. I just threw the same track on t on two tracks. Oh, and, and then one you, was okay. mono, one was stereo. If you're doing a low mid high, you'd make three tracks, and you'd um, and you'd throw probably a, a three band. I don't know EQ on it or something, and then you just drop all the drop all the lows in one, yeah. or leave only the lows in one, leave only the mids in one, leave only the highs in one. 
so with this, both of those purple clips are just like a wave file if you mix down. Yes, these are both. Sorry, I should have the exact that. same thing. These are the exact same thing. That they, they really are. That's okay. And so if you hit render, it. it would. If I hit render without without if I just load them in and hit render, my output would be the same track at twice the decibel range. No, no, right now, if you hit render, yeah, it would just like take like. 50% of the top one and then another. It would add them up. Yeah. So each one of these, this this side bus is peaking at negative 24 in, this is peaking at 12. It sums them up. Now you may notice that, oh, they don't look like they're summing up because you, know, you add those two together and you don't get that on the side. Well, they're taking up different parts of the spectrum. They're, they're, you know, they neatly fit in the mid and the stereo channel, so they're not, they're not necessarily going to be getting that, that huge volume increase. Cool. But um, yeah, and again, as you can see, I'm I'm ar I'm still leaving myself 12 decibels of headroom. You don't bother filling up your headroom until the last pot until you know the last possible minute. You can leave your song quiet quite until the final limit, and you just boost the gain to hit to hit the final limiter. But um, so moving on to uh, dynamics processing, it's now time to make this track kind of aggressive. Um, we're going to go to multiband compression. Um, Ableton stock. Multiband compressor looks like this, and honestly, I think it's the worst user interface in the world. Um, but you've got low, mid, and high bands. Um, and then you've got you, here is an expander. Just don't worry about it. Here, but you, here's your compression from um, down here on this above tab. Is your compression, and so you can choose your threshold. There's, there's three, four, four important parts of a compressor. You're going to have your threshold, your ratio, your attack, and your release. And so what a compressor does is, uh, I mean, who's not, is anyone not familiar with compressors and how they work? It'd be best if you said it. Okay, so a compressor basically, um, it compresses the audio signal. When, whenever it passes your threshold, say I set my threshold at negative six decibels. Every time it passes negative six decibels, it's going to compress that remaining signal, or the overall signal. What is it? Overall signal. Overall signal. Um, so the threshold is the point at which it kicks in. The ratio is how aggressively it compresses. Say, if I have a ratio of four, four to one, that means that for every, uh, that for every four decibels, for every one decibel, come on, help me, help me out here. For every four, you'll get one back. Yeah, for every, for every four you go over, um, it's going to compress by one. Am I, am I? You return with one. You return with one. Okay, there we go. Um, and so heavier, heavier, uh, larger ratios means heavier compression. A limiter, in fact, is a, is a compressor with like a, a really high ratio, like 20, 40, 100, infinity. Um, and all that's doing is just brick walling the sound. Because, I mean, you, go, you, make, you can go over by 10 decibels and it's only going to get a little nice little you know, 0.1 decibel blip over. Um, so I'm... Honestly, I don't want to use this because if any of y'all aren't in Ableton, this isn't gonna, you, you won't remember anything from looking at this. Um, I'm using Wave C6, again, not free, but it, you can, it visualizes everything, and it's beautiful. Um, There's a bunch of free multiband compressors out there. Um, I can definitely post a link um, on the Facebook page yeah. to multiband EQs and multiband compressors that are excellent, and they're freeware, and they're made in developer challenges. And uh, KDR Audio is a great place to find the freeware set. It's excellent and it will do you just as good. If anybody knows Flume, he swears by stock Ableton stuff. He does. That's all he uses. So, so, yeah, so you can use just the stock stuff and not feel like inferior. So the main thing, that, the, the, we're going to be doing two things with this, uh, with this multi-band compressor. Um, and as you can see, it's split up into four sections. You have lows, low mids, upper mids, and highs. And those are and those are down here, lows, mids, upper mids, and highs. The beauty of this one is that when it's compressing by each thing, like I'll show you over here, it actually uh, it actually shows you when it compresses each band. You can actually see what's going on. So that's why I'm using it as a kind of teaching aid. But um, <coughs> can you explain the interface one more time? Oh, I'm just I, I was just saying that you've got this is divided into. Show them where the ADS are. Oh yeah. Yeah, here we go. So uh, this is divided. What's the orange line? What's the purple? Um, the orange line is the 
is threshold. Yeah. No. Uh, is it? But that would be where your signal is going down. So that's zero. Yeah. Degree. And the purple line is how far um, it'll compress. This one's a little more complex in that you can, uh, along with the uh, threshold, you can also set the range, which is the maximum amount. So you could say you could have a threshold or some crazy high ratio, so it, it, it compresses really hard, but you can set the range to one decibel, so it'll compress really hard, only up to one decibel. So that's just a, that's just kind of a little toy. Um, so let's look at our base frequencies first. I'm gonna set it, the crossover at about 120. <laughs> so the crossover is where he's splitting between the low and low mids. So a multi compressor is literally just like four compressors put into one thing, right? And you're, each of them are, each of those little things like the meters in the bottom, each of those are just independent compressors that are doing their job independently. Yeah. This is four, this is one, two, three, four independent and compressors. The nature of multi-band compressors is that since you don't want like the attack times to cause phasing problems, they all have crossover frequencies and set up delays so that it will do the job for you behind the scenes so that you don't like fuck shit up because you accidentally like mess with the attack time too much. And um, you can just split frequencies so that each compressor is doing its job without worrying about the other ones. Yeah. Otherwise, if, you, if you're just using one compressor for the entire signal, well, if you have a bass hit, well, it's gonna compress the, you know, it's gonna compress your hi-hats as well. well why do you wanna compress your hi-hats whenever you get a bass kick? They're not, they're, they're completely different See, frequency ranges. So if you assign one compressor to the hi-hats and one to the basses, fantastic. Um, so here, I'm gonna quickly solo my lows. This is the sub bass. Now, I, I did, and I did this in the mix down, um, most of the sub hit is in like the 200, 250 range, which is way out of the sub bass range, but it's going to be audible on most systems. Now that was just, I just did that on purpose. So I just, you, if your frequencies are too low and kind of inaudible, you can saturate them. And again, this is in the, this is in here, if you want to read through. You can add, you can add, you can do processing on them to add harmonics and make them more audible in higher frequency ranges, but that's a different lesson. Um, so here at the lows, the first thing we're going to do with each frequency range is we're going to shape the transients. Now, you talked about transients last week. Does anyone, did y'all remember transients or no? Okay, let's do transients. Um, <coughs> transients are like, are going to be a sharp change in, in dB level. So um, any sort of, any sort of hit, um, I mean, percussive hell, sound. yeah, any sort of percussive sound, uh, you know, you can have vocal transients, you know, something, ooh, something like, like that. Yeah. Um, those, that's what a transient is, and so you may not really think of it, you, you may not really be thinking about it like when you're listening to, to, um, to music, but how long those transients are is a very, is very important. A longer transient in the bass is going to sound like, is going to sound really like boom, boom, thuddy, but if you, if you really lower down that transient, it'll, it may sound a little clicky, a little snappy, and then if you completely remove that transient, it's just going to sound flat. Um, so how can we shape our transients? That sounds like such a, like a weird, you know, arbitrary thing to do. Well, these compressors, they act, they have an attack. And so an attack is how long they take to kick in. So if you've got that signal rising up, that dB peak coming up real fast, and then it passes your threshold, well, if your attack is point, you know, 0.5 milliseconds or a millisecond, as soon as it raises up, that compressor is like, get the fuck down. And, and you're never gonna, and so that transient, that initial transient, you're never gonna hear it. It's just gonna, it's just gonna flatline. So you're gonna get a nice flat sound. But if you have an attack of 15 milliseconds, then it has time to get over, to get over and, and, and then, and you can precisely shape when your compressor comes in and smacks it back down. And so you can shape that initial bump. And so some sounds are only transients, you know, if it's like a click or something, but a lot of things like snares, basses, they have an initial transient and then a tail. You know, they, they've got that initial click in and then, and then, you know, they fade out. So let's look at, I'm going to lower the threshold down really quick. This is a kind of fun little trick. I'll like basically all the way down and then, um, where's my, so this is basically removing the sound, right? Um, I'm going to set my release nice and slow and then. I hope this works. I'll be really upset. Um, can you hear the? You should be able to hear the transient coming in. Oh, this isn't working. 
Let me just crank it all the way up. Is that your attack time or your least time? That's my attack time. Um, basically, here I'll show you. I'll show you the. I'll show you the uh, technique just on a regular, freaking stock compressor. Um, if I go over here to my, yeah, definitely gonna want to. Um, so if I throw a compressor right here, and um, it's a good. This is how you shape your transients. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lower that threshold to some ungodly level, bump the shit out of my attack, I mean out of my ratio, and so now it's compressing so hard you're basically getting no signal. You get some good. So I'm going to lower my release so I don't have to worry about it. If you have a too long of a release, well you may miss the next transient because the compressor is still compressed by the time it comes through. If that, that makes sense to y'all? If you have a really long release time and it's compressed down real hard, It'll stay compressed down for that for that release time, and so if you have another transient coming through, it may just clip it. Um, so, so here's my heavily heavily compressed signal. So I'm going to start raising up this attack, and you'll hear the transient sound. Hear those those pops starting to shine through? Uh, am, am I doing this effectively? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's what that's that is a, a, an effective way to transient shape. Um, and again, that's all for kind of how you want your track sound. So right. so what do you let the rest of like the over compression? Do you just keep that? No. Once once you get your transient shaped. Sorry. So once once I get my transient shaped, say I've got it. Seconds, then I'm going to raise my threshold up, drop this ratio to something normal like four or three or something, and then bring it down until I can get the compression I want. Right here, I'm getting like my two So, what's the significance of like slamming the compressor when you're like trying to find that? <laughs> um, it's the same, it's almost it's the same concept of boosting and cutting. If you accentuate the problem or what you're trying to do, you make it way too, too apparent. Then you can play with that and, and change the settings to the way you like it on that effect because that effect is way too apparent and you can take the effect back out and mix it back into the correct level. Same with, same with reverb. I'll drown, I'll absolutely drown a sound in reverb um, and then tune up the reverb exactly like I like it and then completely make it a dry sound again and then just push that reverb in but nice and gently. So, what time is it? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to speed through the rest of this. Um, so, we're going to go through. And y'all can read the uh, um, notes. The notes, but uh, so we go through and we transient shape, and then um, and you can gain and you can adjust the gain a little bit to get a to get um, a nice balance on the track. Um, here is before, right here. Notice my gain reduction is going like that. That is the, that's the gain reduction that I allow it to have. So I'm doing I'm doing some pretty heavier compression in the bass to tighten it up, and then I'm letting the highs kind of just do their own thing. That's the purple. That's the purple. Cool. Um, so that's a more complex topic. Honestly, we could have had an entire lecture on each one of these steps, and so I'm just kind of trying to fly through this right now. Um, but you know, what we can we can definitely talk yeah, we'll, about. we'll probably like have a independent talks where you and I or anybody else that wants to contribute will add to this discussion about yeah. compression and about I mean, it's, yeah, it's just hard to, it's hard to explain, you know, the, all these complicated mastering plugins. I know, avoided it last now. lecture, I was just like, get good, because like, yeah. it takes a lifetime to be really That's dang it, yeah. Person. That's the whole point of a mastering engineer, why do you even have a mastering engineer? But my, my goal for y'all is really to, is to, so that y'all can see the, the concept of what you're trying to do when you're trying to master. Yeah, it definitely establish like the workflow of it. Yeah. Um, basically, after you've done your multiband, this is where this is where it gets really quick. Um, you're gonna do what do I have here? Yeah, shaping EQ. Yay! What is shaping EQ? Well, you've already got your compression and your balance track 
as good as you can get it. When you're when you're balancing a track using compression and and gain and as you can see, I'm I'm there's there's different gains on this. Well, um, so I've got I've got my I've got my transient cell shaped with this compressor, and now I want to really just balance the track out. You know, if my bases are still a little too prominent, take them out or something like that. Um, and so I did that in mid side because. Um, I don't know. That's just that's you can you can really do it however you want, but um, mid size seems to give me the greatest amount of flexibility. Um, this white line is the mid, and this blue line is the side. Say you're in Ableton, you can literally do an EQ8 and change. Uh, it's on the right side. It's on the right side. You can go to the mid side mode, and then what edit mid and side. Yeah. Yeah. So here's and so now here's your mids. Here's your side. So you can you're affecting the side channel right now. And you can still see the mid channel. Is this on your master? Yeah, this is just a. This is yeah. This is after my compression on the master. Um, and so what a shaping EQ is going to do is go, is you're just going to kind of just shape the sound where you want. You know, if there's still some problem frequencies, you can get rid of them. Um, or I mean, some areas that you just think are a little too over prominent. I generally, and I didn't really do it in this mix, but for power. So I, I like to boost around 200 in the mid sometimes because that's where a lot of thump is. Uh, in the sides, as you can see, I check out some of the lows again. Um, I love to shelve off the, the highs in the mid channel because they don't add anything to the mid channel in terms of power. If you're going for a powerful track, they don't really add a lot. And you can, add, you can boost in the side track to make up for that, for that loss. If you do that too aggressively, you're going to get, it's like using a stereo measure too aggressively, you're going to get phasing issues. Um, um, why don't you just uh, high pass on the side channel? Like mm -hmm. high pass to like one. Because okay, you're going to get phasing issues. If you, if you aggressively right. use a stereo shaper or anything that has mid mid side like total summing, yeah. you're going to get phasing issues if you aggressively Can you use it. Do that? Plus, you already um, let me. Use it pretty high pass. Well, you're not going to hear it unless it gets summed to a mono PA anyway. Because yeah, that's true. The, the, main, the main issue, uh, keep, keep in mind. Everything in the side channel is phase incoherent. It is all out of phase. So some some of them are, some of the things are just distinct, two distinct sounds panned left and right, which aren't going to sound bad. But some things are genuinely the out of phase, like reverb and sounds like that. And so those out of phase things, they add a nice some nice color to the sound. But if you do too much, if you put boost too much highs and bring in too much out of phase stuff, it's going to sound phasey. Does that fat filter have a whatever it's called setting? Phase option. Or linear yeah. phase equalization. Yeah. Uh, when your fat filter pro Q two, yeah, yeah, but but that will increase your latency hardcore, and you don't want to do that. Unless like a lot. Unless you're in the mastering phase, which you can do here. Yeah. Um. So, um, one thing I quickly wanted to touch on. Um, we've been talking about uh, getting a high volume, um, and you know how you can have a high volume, but your track may not sound as loud. And that's because you you know the, you've got all those extra frequencies in. But once you take them out, you you know you've gotten your track as loud as you know it's peaking at zero decibels, and you're like, well, it's still not still doesn't sound as loud as I'd like it to. Well, that's because um, the, the human ear responds to different frequencies differently. And I have an awesome little picture of the frequency response of the human ear. The backs and doll curves. What's up? Those are the backs and doll curves. Yeah. The loudest curves. About 1.5 kilohertz and 10,000, you get two crazy spikes. Now, funnily enough, funny enough. This 1.5 kilohertz, that is the fundamental, the average fundamental frequency of the human voice. This right here is the location of formant harmonics in the human voice. Formant harmonics are the overtones in your voice that distinguish between A, E, I, O, U. It distinguishes between vowel sounds. So naturally, we've grown very accustomed to it's like uh, an evolution. Can you repeat period. that one more time? These two, these are the two ranges that the human ear is most uh, is most sensitive to, and then obviously bass. So um, the thousand. Is Thousand, yeah, right around here. That's the that's the fundamental note of your average human voice. So what I'm speaking right now, about a thousand, um, and then ten thousand is are the overtones that 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 are make you that your brain hears and uses to distinguish between vowel sounds. So you've evolved. We've evolved to be really f sensitive to those, and it makes it easier for us to understand each other. So if an alien might, we might just sound like muddy like wah, 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 to an alien if they can't hear those. So for music, you should apply it as an understanding that higher frequency sounds don't need as much power and boosting for us to hear them. Correct. Wait. And on the other hand, though, if you know that those sections are the are the sections that your that you're most um, sensitive to, by accentuating some of those sections, you can make your mix 
say say I wanted to boost a little bit around ten thousand, or I wanted to boost a little around um, you know like five hundred. Well, the ten the boost around ten thousand is going to make a much louder perceived difference, while the boost around five hundred is not going to be perceived as loud. While they both may have the same decibel range, so you can get a louder. Uh, your track can be perceived as louder. It's, it's psychoacoustic. Your track can be perceived as louder, even though you're not really raising the decibel level at all. And that is, there's, there's, there's loudness in music. When someone says talking about a loud track, they're talking about perceived loudness. They're not talking about some sort of decibel level or vol, you know, volume. That's one thing. Loudness is, is all about how you perceive it. So. And we can give, an, there's an entire other talk on that. Have you heard about this, like this dude who invented speakers that allow you to play like, I, I haven't. I didn't. I didn't even bother reading because I thought it. I figured. Yeah. It, I they kept talking about like audio quality audio degradation. Audio. I was like, you don't say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know, it just came out right. That whole. Yeah. Thing, yeah. Uh, I don't know what it is, but My name going crazy about it. there's there's the shaping EQ. Notice I ducked a little bit out around. Okay, it's, it's totally arbitrary. I mean, let's be real. I just went through and I did what sounded good. Um, you know, you might want to remove some of the side channel around 400 to 600 hertz, remove some of the mud. That's where all the mud is in your track, is in those low mids, but it is completely arbitrary. Do what sounds good. I mean, what he's, can you keep that up for a second? Yeah. Uh, let's try to make some sense of it. Like, he just said it's arbitrary, but that's because it's his mix, and he sound, it sounded good for his mix. But some of the stuff he said is perfect advice. Like, you don't need stereo information in the low end. That's why he's shelving the low end. But then the 400 hertz range, which is around the average frequency where all instruments tend to collide, right. he's cutting out some of that mud so that he can have more headroom to pump it up later when he uses the L3 Ultra Maximizer. He's shelving the mids at the high because he doesn't need all that information when he's gonna pump it up again because that's gonna be too tinny or harsh for the human ear because we're so sensitive to it. And but he's boosting the mids. <coughs> yeah, notice this gentle, gentle uh, boost right here, right at one and a half. I didn't even, I didn't even notice it at that point, but I, I knew that that range was one of the powerful ranges in terms of getting and in terms of achieving uh, much louder. It seems like that's just the inverse of the other line. Yeah, but you don't always have to do that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll just if the if the lower mids are too muddy, I'll I'll notch out some of the sides, but I'll keep the mids there. You know, I don't necessarily need to boost the mids to make up for it. Um, so yeah, past that, um, there's two quick stages that I don't have on this master bus because they're so totally optional and usually overkill. Um, that's stereo imaging and harmonic excitation. Uh, stereo imaging is doing exactly what it's boosting the side channel. It's doing, it's, it's a little more complex, but you just really don't want to use them. Especially after, if you do this kind of mid-side processing, you're not going to need them. Um, stereo imaging can be taken care of by using depth-based effects like the sounds that he's using, like reverb and delay. Like most of the time you want to get stereo incoherency by doing stuff like that instead of using an artificial stereo enhancer and like a mastering plugin, since that's going to take all the information and try to spread the phases and that's going to cause inherent phase issues because that's what the whole technology is. Yeah, so you don't, the only the only reason I ever pull in a, uh, here, and here's a, here's an imager. The only reason I pull in an imager, um, all this thing does, images each. See, bass is pretty much mono. This is your stereo image. It's just accept that wider is stereo. I, 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 haven't, I haven't looked into too much into how they work. But, so a lot of spread there, more spread there, yeah, yeah. and then the most, and then you know, hell of spread there. The only reason I would use a stereo imager is if I listened to the bass and I was like, or the low mid say, and I was like, oh, there's too much, and I wanted to lower. Again, you can still lead to phasing issues because it's almost it's something to mono. But <laughs> if you're gonna use an imager, use it negatively. Don't don't boost. If you want to boost your stereo image, go back to the EQ and boost the side channel. Make a better mix. Make a better mix. Uh, yeah. So after that, then you're la you're at your last step, and that is limiting. Now, I you shouldn't limit too hard. Um, this track is relatively like flowing, so I could limit the shit out of it, and I did. Don't, I mean, I limited it really fucking hard. Um, I'm writing it through. I got about one to three decibels of attenuation. This is an ultra maximizer. All it is is an intelligent limiter. It's a limiter, but it has, instead of just having a simple, you know, like attack, it has, spe it has specific algorithms for shaping the transients and for how hard it limits to prevent clipping, to prevent distortion. And uh, the Waves L3 Ma Ultra Maximizer is a good one. Um, notice that up until that limiting stage, oh god, 
I'm confusing this alt tab with tab. I'm still at negative 12 dB, even less because I took out so many frequencies. It doesn't even, sorry. So I've got this set on the loud and proud preset. Um, uh, a lot of times with limiters, I just go through and I see, and you know, you kind of see what sounds best. I mean, there's only a few presets. Um, and then I, because again, do what sounds good. I, I limited again. You better believe it. Um, no, it's actually a good idea. Okay. And get that, yeah. So um, you generally want, if you're coming on, a, if you're if you're going through your final limiter, you don't want it to be limiting nonstop. If it's limiting nonstop, you're pushing the entire sound up against the limiter, and you're and you're losing the dynamic range. Now, personally, I completely set fire to that and pushed it up against twice, and look what it's doing. Uh, and but what I did with this, this is Isotopes. Um, limiter, which is the best mashing limiter I know of, um, and so I turned on inner sample detection. Always do that. Um, nice. I'll explain in a minute. But I, I use I'm using the most computationally expensive algorithm, but the one that has the least clipping. And I'm and this this song can clip, so I was like, I'm gonna push it the hell of it through, you know, push it through a limiter, and uh, and you know, use all the intelligent limiter features and try and make it as loud as possible. Again, you probably don't need to worry about this. Just just learn whatever limiter you have, and you know, learn its t its little tricks. Um, I just boned this through limiter until it nearly started clipping, and there even is a little. Bit of just because you make a song loud does not mean your beats are going to hit harder. In fact, they're going to hit softer because everything is about as loud as the drum beats. Correct. So that's why he has transient recovery engaged and is like bumping it up to the maximum. Absolutely level. max. Because he needs that because he's bumping it so hard the entire track that like he needs the dr drums to come out. So that intention intelligent limiter is like, oh, I sense a transient. Therefore, I'm going to try to like tone it, it down for a second. And I think let's see if you can hear it. And then stereo link is makes it individually compress the left and right stereo channel um, or mid side honestly no it's left and right um, and as a result you get you get you know if you have pan stuff it, it, you know it's just a more effective um, so that's about all I got um, can you uh, play the track again just turn the whole chain off yeah I was at, yeah that was um, so we have I know, I should have, that way I could just turn it off. We just, we, we're not all as, uh, as... Prepared as me. <laughs> we don't all have all that, uh... I'm gonna keep it the same volume as we all, so... Here's without. And then this is at the exact same output volume. Workflow, that's what I was looking for. I don't have the workflow, but yeah, whatever. Too late. Joke's yeah. gone. Um, and then this is the exact same volume. So it's not me. As you can see, it's staying there. Now that is not necessarily that is not necessarily a good a good practice. I was just I really didn't care with this. I was just I was like, fuck it. Um, if you're mixing for stereo, like literally like actual people's radios, like then you don't want to do that. This is mixed to go through like a, like a club system, basically nothing else. I have another question. Um, What's up? There's a lot of different like so would say in a club situation if you're performing the song, this would be more for like a DJ set. Right? My question is like, um, I like to experiment with like taking like samples, I guess like stems of songs, and like. My idea of like what a set would be is like sticking the stems in like Ableton and like kind of managing them separately like that. Um, how would you master them for a PS system in that situation? Samples? <laughs> yeah, well, like, like stems. Like, well, split up. if you're pulling them from a finished track, they're already mastered. You don't need to fuck with them. Um, well, I'm talking about like say like your own productions, like say you oh, have like, your own stuff for... and you want to perform that among like your other like songs you said. Well, if you're matters. playing at if you're playing at a big venue, generally speaking, and and, you, and these this not crappy. It's not gonna be a crappy system. It's gonna be a good system. 
and you can just turn the volume up. So dynamic range is still good. You know, you don't want to lose all your dynamic range because you can just crank the volume up. The only reason you'd want to do something like squashing it like I'm doing right now is if it was sounding weak compared to other songs in a mix, you know, like the, say you just had one sound audio file that you're putting on SoundCloud or something with a mix. Um, it, generally, you just don't want to over compress it. Here's it without. <laughs> I mean, what's my signal? I'm sacrificing a lot of of dynamic range, but I'm gaining that much, like in. But you completely lose all sort of dynamic range. I think you so, could, uh, at least just for the the four on the master bus, just turn those four off, and mm -hmm. then. Just like turn them on one at a time as the track plays through. Yeah. Uh, so at this point, all we have is EQing that's basically transparent. So. Uh, I would turn the limiter on, the maximizer on first, so you can hear the the, ball, the changes in the peaks that you took out, because otherwise it's not as apparent. Yeah, that's a good idea. All right. So first thing we turn on is that train is created, and it adds a little bit of balance down, but that's that's. First thing you may have noticed is where the bass go. Well, yeah, it, it, it was too loud. Uh, and but what you will hear is how the low is. Listen for that knock. Oh, it brings out a heat. You do that. And that's that's the point. Um, I one thing I forgot to mention was as you go up the frequency spectrum, you're probably going to make those transients shorter and shorter. That way you get a rounder low end and a snappier high end, and that's generally what sounds best. Again, play by ear. Um, so there's. I'm gonna add shaking EQ. Right up the high, add a little spread the high without it. Pretty damn squash, but it's reasonable. So my extra thing over here, absolute overkill. I was just, I wanted to. Um, to do what you want. That's that's like that's the most important thing. If you decide that you want to go through it, do a low mid high instead of mid side. Fucking dead. Like do what sounds best to you, and and but these are the tools that you have to use. And so I'll be putting up a write up on all the tools. And how, this is how to use all these tools that's on the in six steps. And uh, yeah, so to recap, one, remove unwanted frequencies. Two, shape transients through compression. Three, achieve spectrum balance through gaining compression. I didn't really go into that a lot, but that's, that's in terms of just balancing the overall levels of your track, like psychoacoustics, what I was talking about. EQ shape the desired effect. Loudness, that you know, you might want to do the 1.5 kilohertz and 10 kilohertz. Depth, you know, you may want to keep it a little, you know, on the deeper edge. Sparkle, you may want to accentuate the highs and all that good stuff. And then polishing, which would be stereo imaging, harmonic excitation. If you're doing an acoustic track, some people throw reverb on their master. Don't ask me why they do it. And then final one in it. So that is all I have for y'all. Um, I'll upload this. It's a text file because my computer crashed and I haven't reinstalled my software yet. So open it in Notepad, or else it's going to be. I had to press enter at the end of these lines to do a character turn. Like, it's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, any questions? I had a question. Uh, actually, since something you said last week, um, as I remember when you were talking about when you're like, at least during mixing, you said you, you advised against notch filtering. For mastering, do you also notch filter? Oh, no, no. I, I wasn't advising against notch filtering. Um, I was saying that mixing, mixing is the only time that you should be notch filtering, not during sound design. Like, okay. last, last week's tops was more about okay. like layering and sculpting a sound and multiple sounds together. When you're doing that, you're trying to get a one cohesive layer, right? Mm -hmm. When you have that layer done, and then you're worrying about mixing that with your drums or mixing that with your bass, then it's good to notch filter because you're mixing one element against another one. When you're mixing since, you know, elements together that have similar qualities like lead sounds or pads with lead sounds or chords with lead sounds, it's usually a good idea to shelve and get those mm -hmm. things to mix in together.
right? And then you can worry about not shortening against the rest of the mix. Like, by far the most important thing to do, in fact, during mixing or mastering is to learn how to like pick out resonant frequencies or out yeah. of phase frequencies and then notch those out. Because everything else is like, oh, well, I'm just going to turn this knob up and it's going to be loud, right? But like, the best thing you can do for your mix is notching out and learning, okay. getting a good ear for it. Right. And let me let me A B you real quick. This is compression, all the dynamics processing, but no EQ. Slap on my EQs. It's almost half as louder. Yeah, and then here's the exact same volume. You notice the immediate clarity is different. And then if we go to our master bus, which isn't really a master bus, it's pretty similar. But well, it's peaking around three. So you got a full decibel of. Uh, of, of headroom out of that. And that may not sound like a lot, but a decibel is a shit ton. If you, if you reference two tracks next to each other that are, hitting, that are both hitting zero dB, and one of them has one decibel louder of perceived loudness, that is LUFS. Here's a nice little look. It's on this meter. Um, Wait, what is that type for? LUFS is, and I would advise you to go and read about it, is a loudness meter that takes psychoacoustics into effect. So, um, What's this track hitting? Perceived loudness. It's hitting negative as fuck up. That's why I did it. I just wanted to see what that was. That's loud as fuck. 3.8, that's like what an audience tracks hit. I'm not saying it sounds as good as audience, I'm saying it's hitting the same loudness level. Um, Pompeii sounds, yeah. Pompeii is Pompeii is like 3.3. Yeah, it's disgusting. Now, that's what I'm saying. This perceived loudness, the one decibel, like, is, is it night and day difference in terms of loudness? Um, so, Basically, that yeah, all that EQing work for one decibel may sound like a huge waste of time, but that one decibel is a massive difference. When all of the when all the tracks you hear on the radio are peaking at zero dB, if one is a full decibel higher than the other, I mean negative six dB, and a track is peaking at zero dB, something that's at negative six is almost in, like you would barely be able to hear it for something that's mastered for radio. So that one decibel is a, is a big deal. Convincing um, argument is my comment that that is also because those. Non-musical frequencies, like they're they're gonna they're gonna harshen up the mix. So it's gonna be like psychoacoustically speaking, it's gonna be less pleasant to listen to over and over again. Because you're gonna what happens to when you listen to a song over and over again? You start picking out details that weren't there before, and you don't want imperfections to be something that someone picks up. You want those to be like subtle nuances that someone put thought into. And so it's you're you're treating your track better.